And with that again, welcome back everyone. It's time for a power-packed fireside chat, if I may say, because it's a final uh, panel for the evening. And uh, again, it's filled with a lot of uh, power, a lot of uh, feisty notes, if I may say, because we're talking about where next. That's a big question on everybody's minds, especially when we're talking about technology leadership in a world that's been disrupted so badly. But most importantly, let's try to look forward to some inspiration from the best practices from all our leaders who are joining us in, in a final panel discussion. So I'm definitely guessing that there are some very optimistic points um, of, or insights that are in store for all of us. And this is one session that you're definitely looking forward to. Without any delay, I'm gonna quickly uh, take a minute to also introduce our speakers. Uh, the entire session is in fact being spearheaded by Mr. Abhijit Majumdar, partner and in India leader, Tech Strategy Consulting, PwC India, and he comes with over two decades of experience in defining strategy, implementing transformation, scaling up consulting business, and working with the CXO suite. With that, let me also introduce our set of panelists. We have with us Mr. Anand Sen Gupta, CIO, South Asia Pacific, Carrier Limited, uh, with an experience of more than 25 years in the domain of digital technology, business IT. He's someone who's been driving digital transformations and managing enterprise-wide infrastructure with core competency in implementation and managing the SAP ERP environment and implementing global applications and projects. We also have with us Mr. Manoj Madhavan, CIO, Blue Dot Express Limited. He's someone who's armed with more than two decades, uh, especially in the IT domain. And when we talk about disruption, we are very well aware of how the logistics fraternity has been well disrupted with the pandemic. So it will be absolutely pertinent to gather his insights as well. With that, let me also move forward to introducing our next speaker. We also have with us Mahua Sen Gupta, Managing Director, Mashrek Bank, who is a senior business leader with more than 25 years of experience across the globe, both in the financial services industry and in the IT services industry. She's also served in multiple IT, IT, ES organizations in senior leadership roles before joining the Mashrek Bank. And that leaves me with our final panelist. We have with us Mr. Abhishek Chandra, CIO, IIFL, Wealth and Asset Management Limited. And his responsibility includes heading the solution delivery function and introducing new products and processes. So with that, it looks like we're all set for a very dynamic session, which is why we have aptly titled it The Fireside Chat. On that note, it's time to bring on board our set of speakers in just a couple of seconds. Please stay with us. We'll get the session started right now. Good evening, my esteemed co-panelists, ladies and gentlemen. We humans in our various roles as customers, employees, investors, inventors, regulators, business partners and citizens are just beginning to emerge from this latest set of disruptions in our world, changed. The aftershocks are yet to come. We are expecting them. Now in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. We ask, where next? The technology domain is arguably more dynamic than others in terms of the rate of change. So the technology leaders need to be quick learners and adopters. Technology leaders need to work under, under relentless pressure of higher ambiguity. The tech industry as such has a unique combination of complex of emerging technologies, global workforce, co-optation, and a high velocity competition that requires leadership skills, quite unlike other functions or domains. Technology leaders does require this quite paradoxical skill or combination of deeper dive of technology coupled with a holistic view of business. Now these challenges require a radical shift in the way technology leaders adapt and evolve. They must lead the world seemingly flipped upside down. They must see the opportunities and promptly act to, to create value. In today's concluding fireside chat, we have an eminent panel of CIOs and business leaders with us, with whom I will explore what technology leadership needs to evolve into in order to thrive in this permanently disrupted world. Let me start off my first question to this panel, and Anand, if I may, with you. As a technology leader yourself, how do you see CIOs responding to this persistent uncertainty around us through long-term value creation? Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks, Abhijit. 
so uh, my voice clear right voice is clear yeah okay so so this uh, disruption which was brought from a very unknown sector we were never the world was not prepared i belong to a manufacturing typical a typical brick and mortar company and a companies like us cannot go 100% remote and work from home unlike the it it es organizations so the challenge as a cio was to draw a fine balance because we are a manufacturing the you require people on the shop floor you require engineering team you would require sales and service people service people sales okay you can work uh, you know remotely but service people yes absolutely and we are primarily be so all b2b manufacturing company i am speaking on behalf of them the challenge was that you it was a, you have to draw a fine line between working remote and you know it it took us a while to balance the uh, balance between the right you know who have to go and, and enable them to the keep uh, you know the business going so that was a challenge and you know which we had to and it it's not something which was a, a, a thumb rule we had to keep uh, modifying innovating over a period of time as the scenario evolved over a period of time thanks anand uh, if i may come to you manoj what has been your experience in this area well i think something quite similar to what anand uh, said uh, it's being in an industry which is logistics uh, we could not shut down our operations for us it meant that the operations has to keep uh, running because that's the backbone of uh, the economy when when it comes to whether it is supporting the manufacturing and uh, you know supply chain keep the supply chain running i mean it's keep the baseline it's the baseline of or a lifeline of uh, the industry so for us it meant that the the operational or the shop floor as we call it had to be kept running 100% but yes there were a lot more uh, other functions like say of finance it uh, marketing uh, you know for example which could be uh, which could be work from home and these uh, were very quickly uh, moved into a work from home uh, option Uh, for example some somebody like a customer service uh, without them uh, a lot of operational work also you know gets hampered if you really don't have uh, someone where the customer can you know really reach out to so that was something which was uh, put up on priority so uh, you know it was learning for some of the functions to move into a world where we are really not into the office but you know working from home uh, and, and and things like that it also meant that uh, as the situation was evolving how do we make sure that our workforce is out there on the ground uh, they are kept abreast of the latest information in terms of how the pandemic is spreading which are the red zones where you're not supposed to go and things like that a lot of new processes which were being uh, you know put out there like contactless deliveries or security based deliveries and things like that so we quickly rolled out mobile apps with uh, you know small snippets of uh, learnings which they could quickly uh, you know uh, learn on the go uh, a minute a minute and a half videos or pdfs which could be quickly seen understood learned and then you know uh, moved on because it also meant we had to really take care of our people on the ground that they follow all the rules uh, which were laid down as part of lockdowns or in even in terms of you know maintaining those distances and, and things like that but uh, i think even as as an organization or as an industry uh, the logistics guys were very quick to uh, move into that space we well we were one of those first to actually stepped up and we really saw the traction with our customers also who were willing to uh, you know change uh, change very quickly a lot many changes were done in terms of how the systems interact with each other so that you know the the end customer really doesn't face the pain i think that's one of those learnings of uh, this particular pandemic that how quickly ecosystems evolve how quickly partners can get together uh, virtually and solve problems and move ahead i think that's one of the big lessons for me as a cio uh, one of the other uh, key things that uh, is that in logistics or especially in in, in companies like ours uh, cios always have a table on the strategy uh, discussions you know so which means we we are very very close to the business we really know what happens out there in the field and we make changes pretty fast so it's it's an evolving thing but obviously yes the pandemic was something which 
which is kind of unforeseen, which brought in a lot of changes in a very short period of time. But I think we could adapt quickly. And uh, from a technology standpoint, I think a lot new stuff which got rolled out was also adopted by customers, which you know uh, would otherwise would be a very slow journey. I think that's one of the key things which we found out as part of the uncertain uh, you know, you know uh, environment. Thank you, Manoj. Very interesting. Uh, you know, observations and experiences. I'll come back to you on the ecosystems point you made. But moving on quickly to you, Mohua, uh, you are from a different industry. How have you as a business leader responded to, to uncertainty? You know, not only necessarily this one, but over a period of time. Moha, you're on mute? Yes, yeah. yes, sorry about that. Uh, I see uncertainty and, and long-term value creation. See what typically happens under uncertainty is we focus on immediate uh, band-aid solutions, right? People kind of uh, cut uh, employees, lay off employees, uh, we give up premises, we do some basic, uh, do away with some basic necessities. And that's why we lose sight of the long-term value creation, which can potentially come from these uncertainties. Now, when the first wave happened, I was not part of Mashrik Bank, but I have, I have heard and seen, and uh, we have received plenty of awards for being one of the few banks who were fully operational, almost entirely from uh, working remote. I mean, there were a few uh, people who were in the branches but mostly we were fully operational uh, from home across the globe. Now, how is that possible? And what have we done since then? See, the main focus that was taken on was to actually take it up as an opportunity. And the bank very soon realized that if it is possible to work from anywhere during the BCP time, then why can't we do this uh, on a regular basis? So immediate focus was uh, laid on uh, technology to improve the work experience from uh, when, you're, when people are working remote. As a result, what had happened is people could actually function fully. And currently, when I'm part of the bank and I'm leading the bank now, we are still on BCP. And I, when I manage the SLAs, I see that there has been no, absolutely no change in the SLAs or the SLAs have not been impacted because of this. And that is primarily because the focus was on technology to make people fully operational and fully functional, uh, but including trainings long-term, I mean, for long distance, so teams had been enabled for everybody and fully enabled. So with that, what has happened now? In, so we looked at, focused at that instead of laying off people or cutting back on space. So now we are in a position when the bank has actually gone on with the motto of work from anywhere. So now we can potentially look at, in the longer term, we can potentially look at reducing our brick and mortar space, we can focus on reducing some of the administrative cost. So ultimately, in a longer term, shareholder value would be created or is being created. In the short term, it is not cutting back on cost, which can be cut immediately, because then we will possibly see the immediate gain in PL, but that is typically not long term. So this is primarily what we have done, besides umpteen other things in order to make it happen, because it's a complete uh, paradigm shift for any bank to go fully remote. Right, very interesting points, Mova. Thanks for sharing. Moving on to you, Abhishek, your experiences and thoughts on this. Abhishek, you're also on mute. Abhishek on mute. Yeah. Sorry, hey, thanks. thank you, Abhijit. And uh, hello to all my fellow colleagues. You know. Uh, so I, I look at saying that uncertainty is like a weather, right? There will be always ups and downs. So there's rise and fall. So we have seen over last 18 months also, that there was a very negative, sharp dip, right, from an uncertainty perspective. And then you started getting some clarity or, or something moving positively. And again, we hit the second wave, right? So this is something which is going to stay with us. And one of the most important things which we have learned over the last 18 months is that how do you go ahead and plan your things throughout this uncertainty phase. Because it's not going to stay. It's, it's not something which is gone and will not come again. This uncertainty, like these will continue. 
uh, we in our organization use this as a very optimal chance to go ahead and introduce and enforce things which we were not able to do in the past to share with you we come from a wealth management business and a wealth management business is considered to be a very high touch high engaged business with the customer all right from there today where we are able to do 100% of our portfolio reviews with the customer online over a video collaboration engine or over teams or a zoom engine is possible only because of a huge change which happened in the mindset over this period right we did try to drive uh, such changes uh, earlier in 1890 but everyone was resistant the team sitting internally in the organization was resistant clients on the other side were resistant everyone wanted that physical meeting in place but this all changed so i think using such uh, uncertainties and identifying the opportunities in them helps helps a lot we have uh, invested a lot lot in our workforce in all the three areas uh, one was enabling them to work uh, we had always our remote uh, working capability in place we enhanced it so that 100% of the people can work uh more importantly we used a lot of this time to skill and train the people so a lot of training programs got introduced as a part of this last 18 month exercise because we realized that the team members and our colleagues and our employees have lot more time available and and we wanted to use that uh right because they were not traveling they were not losing time on traveling uh and and we of course could not do any co curricular or extra curricular activities which we would normally do as as an organization so we started using that time for doing upskilling and training and that's where it has helped us thank you abhishek very interesting thoughts you know taking on from where you left manoj you know you you briefly spoke about uh how quickly your ecosystems evolved let me come back to you first with the second question now during these times of uncertainty how have you leveraged these evolving ecosystems by connecting different technologies and possibly by linking likely and unlikely alliances well uh like i said before i mean it's it, it was a situation which demanded a, a, a lot of changes both at our end uh for our customers and the customers customers uh you know uh for example uh, till before that uh, the delivery or the courier person would actually uh, bring the shipment to your doorstep uh you could you know if it's a cash on delivery you could pay cash and things like that but the the whole ground rules of lockdown made sure that there are times when you don't even meet the customer right then how do you go around making these deliveries without impacting or breaking down on those rules but making sure that the promised date of delivery is met so it it meant for us working very closely with say for example banks or e-commerce uh, customers of ours to be able to integrate uh, to be able to come like i said uh, quickly across virtual meetings to say how do we now change this say for example a securitized delivery which needed a kyc document how do we now move on to an otp based delivery though i would be uh, you know delivering the shipment to maybe the the uh, the security guard at, at at the building's doorstep how do i ensure that it is still reaching the right person uh, so the person reaching there maybe giving up uh, giving a call to the customer making sure uh, the other details are right then you know asking them for a otp which is pre sent to them confirming that and then leaving that delivery if there is a cash to be collected the digital wallets or you know the bank net banking all of these were enabled so that the customer can make those payments too you know it it, it was then merged together to form a very smooth transaction for the customer so that the end customer really didn't feel the pain of what was happening similar was uh, our working with our own vendors whether it is the the uh, you know uh, vehicle providers whether it's the stationary providers and so we started bringing most of them on to the digital platforms integrating through apis making sure all the data flow in real time basis similarly the customer could see uh, what's happening where those shipments are in the in the supply chain when is it supposed to reach the last mile when is it getting out scanned from the last mile and out for delivery so we created those systems integrated it with our customers and partners to make sure that everybody was aligned on what was happening with their shipment so this kind of uh, you know visibility made it very clear to all the players in that particular shipment being taken up from a pickup location to a delivery location 
everybody was aligned in terms of what was happening and how it was happening so this kind of uh, you know uh, real time information sharing at this scale including all those steps of like i said securitized payments you know calls going through uh, digital collection etc etc would not have happened in the past as smooth but these systems as they were integrated it became like a seamless uh, experience for the customer so this is how we talked about uh, you know integrating with those ecosystems of creating what we call as digital ecosystems for customers and partners right very interesting manoj uh, visibility improvement customer experience sustained you know very interesting how you guys did that uh, moho if i turn to you what has been your experience of leveraging ecosystems different technologies unlike alliances so <clears throat> banks as we know today abhijit are uh, more an app than a brick and mortar building right today's generation doesn't recognize the buildings of banks so for an app a very basic principle of an app to be successful is that when somebody opens it they should be lingering on it the longer they linger on it the better it is for you and how is that possible that is a banks are today focusing on providing multiple services many of which go well outside of the usual banking services and products and how do they do it we do it through alliances so almost every bank today has multiple alliance partners so that multiple different services can be offered be it paying your electric bills or paying your uh, broadband this that and the other or even simply just uh, doing some online shopping so multi- that is a focus area for every bank and that had i would say that journey had started much before but this whole lockdown situation has actually aggravated it because um a digitalization had taken a leap frog i mean all most banks have done a leap frog jump for uh, digitalization now likely unlikely alliances uh, these to me are likely alliances huh this has been happening before now um look at the regulators and alliances with the regulators it is always for banks and regulators it was always okay you're always being monitored by the regulators this lockdown has shown how the regulators can become our friends look at how stpi and scz rules had been revised in order to meet the requirement and it was done so fast so seamlessly people could actually take their laptops and desktops and things back home and start functioning couldn't have happened i mean we couldn't have thought about or imagine this few months back i mean when i say few months few months before the first uh, lockdown similarly there are see uh, this google whole google plex that has got you know this is what is that that's a checking account which is being offered by google tied up with, to google play google pay and so many different banks have signed up i'm sure this would have been a success even without uh, this pandemic but the pace at which the banks have started signing definitely that has been uh, i mean uh, that has become much faster thanks to this pandemic so th- this is an unlikely alliance i mean technology companies yes they were always ca- very close to the banking uh, field but this pandemic has actually merged the two so banking for, for that uh, matter and uh, abhishek will uh, also agree with me this whole ecosystem of regulators banks uh, financial services organization big tech firms reg tech fintech etc i think it has all become a mixed bag all of us today provide services and skills which others need to service their clients so every bank including my own bank we all focus on a very deliberate ecosystem strategy and also implementing it very effectively that has been our mantra and uh, we are pursuing it and i think this is for here to stay right a, del- a deliberate ecosystem strategy that is here to say well said abhishek if i move to you sure no in fact i would i would carry on from where mohua was sharing i feel from unlikely alliance perspective and i very rightly picked up by mohua right? i feel no one would have thought that regulator would support us in this manner let me share an example uh, myself on what we have seen so we introduced digital onboarding and because we deal with hnis and ultra hnis we have products which are product portfolio management services and alternative investment funds 
and typically these are uh, you know a little thick bunch of account opening forms because given the various terms and conditions and the information and the disclosures that we need to do the right? regulator was so forthcoming uh, both rbi and sebi in trying to hear out the challenges understand acceptability of msdl based aadhar uh, e sign uh, capabilities right what is acceptable how long can you carry on with the soft copy so so the whole accommodation which was being done right saying that oh yes we understand the world is changing we need to look at it in a very different manner the data way the data will get captured the frequency at which the data will get captured the way the process would work will stand very different and that's helped us roll out the whole digital onboarding project which we embarked on within a period of 3 4 months where we are now able to fully onboard a client without even visiting him once right something which was again as rightly being said right it was not something which was holding for this to happen but i feel it accelerated with with the whole pandemic it accelerated at a pace which it would have not happened now right because you had everyone had their own constraints thoughts which all merged together saying this is the only way if you don't go digital if you don't do it online it will not happen uh, and and that's what helped us right we also did during this time uh, uh, a lot of new uh, pro- projects primarily one big initiative was around introducing rpa platform uh again an exercise uh which we would have normally would embark on right but here it gave us an opportunity to introduce rpa in various areas which we would have normally not done on uh which which we were sitting remotely there were new cohorts which were getting identified new opportunities which are getting identified sitting away from office so oh, this is a very very good likely candidate which when you always in office you feel oh this something cannot be done unless i step in office so in both these cases we have seen huge uh, benefits thanks abhishek the regulators were forthcoming and and that enabled a lot of this ecosystem that's very uh, that's a very interesting perspective as well anand if i move to you your thoughts okay so uh, one of the uh, surveys in the cio community was which is the biggest digital transformation driver which is, is there and it was found out that unfortunately covid was one of the biggest digital transformation drivers which forced us right to add to what bahua and abhishek said uh, equivalent of what they have in regulators we have our ecosystem of government authorities the tax people we have a suppliers and that was critical in manufacturing your whole value chain system should work perfect so what happened similar to what happened in case of bssi segment uh, the government responded and you know uh, uh, to drive uh, you know digitalization and remove paperwork in a very fast pace that's number one where we where it usually has a problem is the suppliers part suppliers are of different shapes and sizes and they are everybody is not does not have a digital appetite to move into swiftly into a digital platform without you know uh, removing paperwork have connected systems so that was a challenge <clears throat> the third component of the whole thing is the employees themselves so usually in in the effort for digital transformation the biggest uh, 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 you know stakeholders are the are the employers employees the internal customers who have so that's by human nature resistance to change and you know any typical brick and mortar company manufacturing companies have have this resistance to change and as a human we ha- we try to kind of uh, uh, go away from the new way of working now when there was no option that adoption went very fast there are silos of systems there were silos of systems we were and usually organizations of uh, like us are usually not 100% connect value chain the whole business processes order to cash we procure to pay are not completely connected you know and we had and and suddenly what happened was there was a need to do that after the stance in last year when there was everything was cancelled we had to do it and we kind of scaled up very rapidly and that was a big learning right and 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 people had no other option that that to adopt so the the learning was if you don't give the your employees an option to adopt they will adopt so uh, otherwise you know there is there has been always a challenge in that and and in my past as a long career i have seen that the biggest challenge has been internal adoption depend and it, it differs from organization to organization so that was that that was a uh, thing and and some of the you know stakeholders which suddenly came into our picture which was not there for example i'll just give you an example and it's with all of us right the virtual collaboration platforms 
there were hardly any right there were hardly any and we were just you know it was like some calls which we had to take it, it, there were only couple of them which i'm aware of suddenly there's a spurt of them and they scaled up very fast and that also helped us you know and we to be very honest two years back i would not even think of you know collaboration platform virtual collaboration platform okay that's fine it's good to have now it's mandatory so there were many uh, you know alliances which happened during this rapid transformation in the first phase so that's where you know kind of uh, thanks anand very interesting perspectives you know from being uh, resistant or hesitant to embrace these changes now the employees not only adopted but you are also saying that the virtual collaboration platforms are are the sort of way of life now so very interesting how you guys have uh, used the whole ecosystem to evolve let me move on to my next question uh, how do you see future innovations in your organization or your industry that will allow leaders to reach beyond today's today's knowns create greater value or have greater impact for tomorrow's world are you seeing some of these taking concrete shape now mohan let me start off with you this time So, see again for banks or for everybody. I'll talk from a banking perspective. Embracing emerging technologies has started a while back, so that is nothing new. What has happened as a result of this pandemic is that the importance of flexibility has come out in the light. So today's focus on emerging technology has to also be in how flexible is our strategy, and how if we put the customer in the center. we all try to and that was always the focus that lay out a long to longer term strategic plan for your technology and then you uh, your year on year planning has to match to that so t- you try to play with that today it's a lot different make it very flexible put the customer at the center so that the customer once he moves uh, in a different direction be it due to the pandemic be it for something else you can automatically change your strategy move your strategy i want to change your strategy because it's not easy you can move your strategy accordingly to fit the customer's requirement that i think has become the key focus for every bank so the future of banking looks very different today because of multiple things changing customer expectations emerging technologies and most importantly we don't still don't know what lies ahead we know this much that it's not going to be what we had left off but what exactly will happen we don't know to be specific within the technology arena there are a few areas which are of focus one is say digitalization was a focus for a long time but it more or less we all know it stayed in the customer experience space when it is touching the users today's focus is digitalization across for us cyber security and financial crime can't talk more about it that is just it takes away people's uh, sleep at night data data integrity analytics and also monetizing data going back to what we talked about before how we are becoming how uh, uh, banks are how what is the focus today we are not just offering banking services so we need to make sure that we are actually monetizing our data to address our customers various needs which go much beyond the uh, purview of banking enterprise agility i've already talked about it future of work see today banks have every bank has so much of work being done by ai so how do you merge these to your digital workforce and your human workforce how do you merge them seamlessly and how in this new evolved situation how do you ensure that your people still grow there is an environment that you create which uh, pushes people's talent development it's a completely new world and which has suddenly come and hit us and finally we talked about it already orchestrating the ecosystem i mean in a banking industry this just we can't uh, i mean it can go all the way I, i just can't stop talking about that orchestrating the ecosystem so that is these are the key focus areas from a bank's perspective in order to be successful uh, bank of the future thanks moa very interesting points the moving the strategy to fit the customer and and the importance of flexibility being more yeah uh in the same vein abhishek if i may ask you for your comments 
are you on mute uh sure uh, so i think one important thing uh, which is happening uh, or which we see as an organization is that the ecosystem or the alliances are only going to grow i feel there's a very important balance that we all are stitching that what is that we are building versus what we are actually partnering not even sourcing i would say but rather partnering in the whole whole ecosystem out there which is out of as as was being covered in the previous sessions on fintech edtech or regtech right or even paytech how do we how do we capitalize on this ecosystem and still build uh, new new platforms and new innovations over and above that so that we can serve our customer i think that's that's where the future is going to be like we are defining our own uh, digital map uh, for digital 2.0 Uh, where we have a big role, or we see a big role being played by all our partners, right? I mean, just to take an example, like as a we have asset management company, right? Traditionally, we would have always looked at distributing our products always through banks uh, or, or or financial advisors. But now, if you see, there's a whole whole cohort of uh, new complete online distributors which are available who have not seen their client ever. Uh, which is a very different scenario, right? A, a banking relationship would have always met a client at least once in life. This is not the case now. Uh, so, like this, or even the whole democratization which is happening around the ecosystem of banking itself. Every bank is today out with an API, so you necessarily don't need to run for a banking license. You rather partner with right banks and still get all the flexibility which you would need from doing a, a payment or a transaction perspective. So, so the whole. innovations which which are going to be now evolving for any any business is not just what you develop but how well you partner uh, with all the ecosystem and all the alliances which are available today in the market thanks abhishek uh, in the interest of time i am requesting all of you to be in a, a little more crisp anand if i turn to you what are the future innovations uh, your industry are, are seeing so a uh, couple of things uh, so one thing the learnings are that uh, there cannot be real long term planning as of now it has become a lot of uncertainty that's number one we have to be agile and flexible and adopt practices where we are able to scale up and change there are not you know uh, strategies which kind of you know work for five years i i and i personal opinion now with this new scenario you cannot have a five year or seven year plan that's a wish list you can have yes going digital uh, with our industry having uh, using the new technologies of ai machine learning try to be connected be in a connected world work the smart way these are some of the areas where industries like us are trying to adopt and to what and to what mohan has said in uh, in a previous statement is that people are now uh, having a mobile mind shift so we have to see how we can move Uh, make them the customer centric process mobile based so that is also applies to our industries not as much as the bfsi segment but to a certain extent absolutely yes so these are certain of certain plans on a broad level and you know to be very honest obviously uh, we have to keep innovating and thinking about and things may change things uh, things and we have to uh, you know uh, course correct in our journey of digitalization forward right i wanted to keep it brief you know as you mentioned so uh, thank you anand very interesting and uh, no real long term planning will succeed uh, that's probably something we all are realizing and the shift in everyone's mind to go to a mobile first ecosystem and how to adapt to that manoj with that if i come to you quickly your thoughts on future innovations uh well the way i i kind of look at it uh, abhijit is is as an organization uh, in a particular industry Uh, it's about what is the strategic posture that you're kind of taking up you know uh, whether you want to be uh, somebody who is shaping the future by creating new standards or setting up creating new demands or uh, you know you're more of uh, looking at adapting to the future as as kind of new opportunities come up or you know the competition brings up something so it's it's largely dependent on the strategic posture as to what kind of innovation you would be looking at but if you really look at supply chain or logistics for that matter i think a, a lot of new technologies out there are already creating uh, you know a, a lot of uh, uh, action out there i mean you have somebody uh, you know looking at space logistics which is like really the the future maybe 20 25 years or maybe 10 years down the line or a hyperloop to be the, the extreme of it but if i come back to what where uh, you know 
we kind of operate in or maybe the next two, three years, a lot of things that you would see would be around, say, a blockchain, uh, maybe artificial intelligence and machine language, uh, machine learning, which is being significantly used by a lot of, a lot of the organizations to optimize their supply chain. Uh, you know, then there is your autonomous transport, which is slowly gaining traction in terms of how, uh, you know, uh, uh, things can be driverless, for example. But uh, with, the, with the digital ecosystem developing in a way where these kind of machines can talk to each other, the way I kind of foresee this happening in, in, in a, a shorter time than longer is where you will start to see self-orchestrated supply chains, you know, because it's all machines making these decisions like Mova said some time back, where artificial intelligence is actually making a lot of decisions based on data as compared to people and they're much faster in terms of reaction. So you will see that a, a large part of the optimized supply chain would be driven by those. And you as humans would be more about, you know, understanding the customer experience and creating new products. But obviously it will all boil down to what kind of technologies you're playing around with, whether it's robotics or automation in how you manage your warehouses, whether it's augmented reality or, you know, 3D, 4D printing, which could change the way manufacturing uh, you know, strategies are built by a lot of these uh, uh, companies. So I think that's that's where uh, logistics would uh, be looking at, largely in terms of self-orchestrated supply chains over a period of maybe the next five to six years. Thanks, Manoj. Very interesting. Uh, strategic posture will define uh, the sort of innovation that people will adopt and how M2M technologies will decide a lot of the self-orchestration uh, you know, across the supply chain. Very interesting. If I may turn to the last question and very quickly your thoughts on it each for about a minute each. Uh, what are the new world skills that you guys think are required by CTOs and CIOs to help navigate their organizations through these uncertain times? So my question is more around what are the skills that CIOs themselves need rather than the organization leading. Abhishek, quickly, starting off with you first this time. So I feel uh, as, a, as a CIO, there are two responsibilities. One is towards the organization and second is towards your team. I feel towards the organization, as rightly said, uh, dynamic strategy uh, is, is the way to look at it. No linear strategies would work. Uh, rather, try to put a more technical vision or a digital vision for the organization and keep reviewing it on a regular basis. And, uh, another cross check which we need to regularly have is ensuring that there are no pseudo ITs which are developing. That's the risk that we live with today in this world. Right? There could be a small pseudo ID team developing within the organization, given that so many things are available on SaaS. So that, that's that's the check that we need to have. The last, which I believe very important, is to as CIOs towards your own team team on how you empathize and how you keep upskilling your team members. Right? There is. A, sizable set of people who will be always there in your organization who have been there with you long and they need to be upskilled with these new set of and new tools and new uh, technologies which are there in the market. So. Thank you Abhishek. So dynamic strategy and empathizing and upskilling that team clearly comes out. Anand, if I turn to you, your thoughts on the new world skills for the CIOs? Oh, first of all, uh, the CIOs should be more flexible. Uh, look from a customer centric processes should be customer centric and inward looking process should be very efficient as abhishek mentioned up you know uh, the the team of uh, the employees the organization has to be have more uh, capability from adoption of digital uh, strategies and digital uh, platforms so that is critical but i think going forward you know and constant uh, there is uh, the, so as i mentioned in my previous comment there is no long term you have to keep changing and reviewing, reviewing your strategy every year. So that's that, that's what the comment I had. Right. So process should be customer centric and the, ability, and the ability to adapt to digital and constantly review. Well said. Manoj, your thoughts? Uh, well, I think adding on to the points that Anand and Abhishek made, I think one of the key elements for uh, the CIO or CTO would be the ability to see the big picture, you know, and and like uh, Abhishek did mention before, there is no uh, static strategy which will be uh, a long-term strategy. So you will be working on strategies at continuous intervals to see what is 
actually happening out there. And like I said before, uh, the strategic posture would define uh, what roadmap you're going to take and how it would change. So uh, the the ability to put on the strategic thinking hat uh, and be the evangelist in the organization to be able to identify the tech that is applicable and you know effective and not just tech for tech. I think that's one of the key elements uh, or a role that CIO would have to play over and above what Anand and Abhishek have I've kind of already said. And I think one of the other uh, things that I would also uh, put up as, as, as a key thing is to understand and be adaptable to technology. Sometimes we get married to our tech and then we kind of want to drag it for a long, long time. Uh, you know, instead, we should be able to build, uh, you know, not monolithic large applications, but the landscape should be in such a way that you can plug and play, uh, maybe on cloud and stuff. But a resilient architecture, obviously cybersecurity being right at the top there, but your ability to be agile and flexible and be able to respond to business fast. Because there are times when you might be leading the way in certain areas, but in certain new areas which are identified, you should be able to respond pretty quickly. I think those are some of the key elements other than the people piece, which are equally important. This is what I feel can be an add-on as a you know, uh, as on as a feather in your cap, uh, right? Manoj, the ability to see the big picture, be an evangelist for the organization, and and have resilient architecture, very well articulated. Mohua, if I may come to you. So I will take a very different take to all this. All the technology skills that is a given. I mean. Anybody who is a CIO or a CTO has grown and it, technology is an entry barrier. What I would say is um, over the last decade, what has changed and which is going to increase more and more is that tech skill is just a de by default. What the CIOs or CTOs needed to have for the last one, I would say at least a decade is the business knowledge, understanding of business, because gone are the days for te of tech for tech which is where it started. So uh, maybe a couple of decades back, technology was a very in thing, which is not anymore. So today's technology is for business. So understanding business, being business savvy above and beyond tech savvy is key. Third is Abhish to Abhishek's point that pockets of IT gets created. There is no way of uh, avoiding that because today most of the IT purchasers are business people. Gone are the days when CIO would purchase all IT. So the CIOs or CTOs need to be have the in, skill to influence the business stakeholders in order to maintain or have their IT strategy in place across the organization, which is not directly reporting to them, but they will have to influence. So being politically savvy in the corporate world is the third thing. So today, CIOs are going forward. CIOs have to be well-rounded. It cannot happen for people who would be growing through the ranks, doing only IT. So somebody much more well-rounded, even if they haven't done coding in their first life, would can potentially make a great CEO tomorrow, CIO tomorrow. Thank you, Mohua. You know, indeed, you know your last comments sort of wraps up the whole sentiment that the tech skills, while they are very uh, important, but they're also default by now. And being business savvy uh, for the CIOs is really the, the next level of evolution. And for them to you know, influence businesses uh, with, and being an evangelist, if I you know borrow Manoj's words, and being politically savvy is the way for them. Uh, if these are the skills that they should have. Well, I, I you know enjoyed this conversation very much. And if I Quickly summarize my takeaways. I think you know this is a fantastic uh, perspective from you know business leaders like yourselves. You know CIOs essentially are coming across as, as responding to this whole uncertain uncertainty, primarily as a as a reaction, but very well adapted. Whether it is you know ensuring work from home, feasibility for the staff, or or making it available across to a wider section of the customers. Essentially, CIOs have very quickly adopted through uncertainty and, and resulted in high-end uh, value creation. That is now putting some, organ some of these organizations 
uh, at the right foundation for, for greater success now. Also, what came across very clearly is that across industries, everyone has been evolving their ecosystems by connecting technologies, whether it is the financial services sector or the logistics and the manufacturing sector, the regulators and the suppliers, they have also come forward and done their bit to make this ecosystem work. So that's very encouraging to see and hear from you, you know, firsthand. On innovations, what comes out very clearly is that the flexibility has come up. A lot of you are putting customers at the center, but at the same time, you also acknowledge that there is no real long-term planning. And a certain level of agility is required as you do innovations on your feet. And the strategic posture, as one of you said, really defines what sort of innovations you know, you're going to adopt, whether you're going to be leading, lagging, following, that, that's all defined by where you want to be in the industry. And most importantly, the CIOs need to evolve themselves. Uh, the ability to see the big picture, the ability to get all the tech parts together to be, to be dynamic, and more importantly, to be business savvy and to be a, an evangelist of technology to guide business to the next stage of evolution is what the CIOs need. So very, very interesting discussions. I myself learned quite a bit. I hope the audience has enjoyed it as much. Any last comments from anyone? Otherwise, I think this has been a very, very satisfying uh, discussion. And, and I hope you know all of us enjoyed it as much as I did. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And it's always great to learn from leaders from different industries, you know, different perspectives, always a learning for me. So thanks. Thanks for all those inputs from all of you. Thank you very much. Handing, handing it over back to you, Kavya.